to the National Security College at the Australian National University. Uh, my name is Rory Metcalf. I'm the head of the college and it's a real pleasure to welcome this group here this evening for the next in a very important series of speeches at the college on securing Australia in an age of, uh, of disruption. Now, before we begin, uh, as is customary, I will acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past, present and emerging. And just a reminder to us all that uh, because this is uh, very much a live webcast and we're welcoming uh, an audience from around the country and I suspect internationally as well, uh, a reminder that uh, we're on the public record, please keep your phones on silent uh, and if you want to catch the recording later on it will be available on the ANU uh, TV uh, YouTube channel and also the National Security Podcast. So as this difficult year uh, has, to, to make an understatement, has demonstrated, national security policy uh, really must be made in a very dynamic and complex environment that breaks down the boundaries between technology and society, the boundaries between economics and security, and the boundaries very much between the domestic and the international. In other words, foreign policy no longer exists if ever it did, in a realm that is somehow removed from uh, the life of the nation, the life of citizens at every level. Instead, diplomacy, uh, as Australians now know, I think, is linked not only to our national interest in a very inextricable way, but also to all the layers of our society, our economy and our national security. So in that context, it's a real honour this evening to welcome Francis Adamson, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and trade. Uh, now our format this evening is that the Secretary will shortly deliver her remarks, uh, a prepared speech on some of the key issues uh, now and into the future. And then uh, it's my privilege to be joined in conversation by the Secretary where we'll, we'll discuss some of those issues in a little more depth and then I look forward to inviting questions from the floor and we'll wrap up in about an hour or so from now. The National Security College, of course, is a partnership between the Commonwealth Government and the Australian National University. So it's my pleasure at this point to invite the Vice-Chancellor of the University, uh, Professor Brian Schmidt AC, to formally introduce our speaker. Vice-Chancellor, thank you. Thank you, Rory, and thank you and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Rory, thank you for your acknowledgement uh, to country, and I, too, uh, pay my respects to elders past and present, none of all Nambri people here, uh, uh, but we do acknowledge that people are listening across Australia. Welcome back, Francis. It's great to have you. Uh, Secretary Adamson, as I should say formally. Uh, it's also uh, uh, a warm welcome uh, to Paul Simon. It's great to have you back on our uh, campus as well. I also note that we have uh, a whole host of members of the diplomatic corps uh, with us today, many friends of the university, uh, Dean Sharon Bell is here, students who I see, professors Emer Emirati are here. Uh, it is a great event, even if still a small one, but each time I come to this room, there's a few more people allowed in, and that is progress 2020 style. As Rory said, tonight's address is part of a series to mark the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the National Security College here at ANU. And I can say what a market impact the college has had over that period and will continue to have in the future. We've just been discussing its future this week uh, here. Uh, and I have really seen that impact in the last 18 months as we have reached a dynamic time in the world, and it's great to have it amongst us to be able to take the foundational research we do and combine it uh, with practitioners and, uh, and, and things that are going on in real time. Uh, the series uh, that we are here to mark today is around the theme of securing Australia in the age of disruption and well, definitely well chosen title uh, since that, that title is almost a year old and it's included perspectives from the former Director General of Security, Duncan Lewis, the Secretary of Home Affairs, Mike Pizzullo, the Director General of the Australian Signals Directorate, uh, Rachel Noble, and the Deputy Secretary of National Security in the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Carolyn Miller. 
so it is, uh, it's been a really interesting group. I've, I've had a chance to listen to most of them. Uh, and the wide support for this uh, speaker series is a reflection of the stature of the National Security College across the many government agencies and departments uh, that support it uh, and help it advance the national interest. For my part, I know that on behalf of my colleagues here at ANU, that, uh, that I am extremely proud of the many roles that the college takes. It takes it as a training ground for thousands of Australian government officials, as an academic center for research and policy-oriented development, uh, and teaching that development uh, so that the next uh, generation of security thinkers are really caught up into modern thinking. It is a place uh, to serve as a platform for national debate about emerging security issues, and it is a trusted platform to connect the academic excellence of this university with government officials as they develop new policy options for the challenges that await our nation. I know that this work and policy contestability and futures analysis has been an expanding priority of this, the college under its head, Professor Rory Metcalf, and it is appreciated amongst uh, government and academia alike, noting that the university has its own challenges and used these services as well to understand what's going on in the future. I certainly have no doubt that the college's next 10 years will be as influential as its last, probably more so. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined uh, by one of Australia's foremost policy thinkers, Francis Adamson, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Welcome, Francis. Prior to her appointment as Secretary, Ms. Adamson was International Advisor to then Prime Minister, the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull. And from 2011 and 20 to 2015, uh, Francis was Ambassador to the People's Republic of China. And I had the opportunity to meet you several times while you were there. She also sits as a member of the National Security College uh, Board. Secretary Adamson has continued to lead DFAT during one of its most challenging times for Australia, uh, and indeed what the world has faced, unprecedented in my lifetime. Despite the challenges this year has brought, Secretary Adamson has described the pandemic as an opportunity for the Australian Public Service to start again with a blank slate and transform the way it operates for the better. Definitely a glass half full type of person. This is not the first time Secretary Adamson has led through disruption. She was living in Taiwan during the SARS outbreak in 2003. So I guess you got well tuned up then. Uh, and Secretary Adamson, I thank you for making time to be with us here tonight. I am, as always, looking forward to hearing your observations on a critical and challenging uh, phase uh, as Australia deals with an ever-changing and dynamic external environment. And I am sure you've had to tune your speech up just this week, given as the world is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So without further ado, I would like now to uh, invite Secretary Frances Adamson to give her address. Thank you, Frances. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor, for that kind introduction and the two acknowledgements of country with which I associate myself uh, most uh, sincerely. Professor Medcalf, ANU staff and students, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Your Excellencies, Australian Public Service colleagues, and I want to acknowledge particularly my colleague Paul Simon, uh, a fellow leader in the DFAT portfolio, friends. It's a pleasure to be here at the National Security College as part of your 10th anniversary lecture series. Already in just a decade, this college has become part of Australia's national security firmament, training officials, influencing policy debates, facilitating dialogue, undertaking foundational research, leading us through futures thinking, and providing a platform for government leaders to explain security assessments and policies. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the nature of the strategic landscape in 2010, when the NSC was formed, rather more about how it looks in 2020, and then chance my arm, I assure you, Brian, this speech was up to date an hour ago when I finished it, uh, about how we might want, when 2030 rolls around, to look back on the decade between now and then. 
What will we need to have done to have advanced Australia's national interest? Over the past decade, we've seen a profound change in the nature, scale and urgency of the nation's security challenges. In 2010, 9-11 and conflict in the Middle East still loomed large, consuming US attention. And the global economy was in shock following the global financial crisis. But international cooperation had rallied in response. The G20, after all, emerged and proved its mettle in a coordinated response to that financial crisis. There appeared to be little serious argument between governments that open trade, integrated economies and global institutions made sense and delivered the best outcomes for their people. US global leadership was seen as self-evidently in that country's interests and without serious challenge, even as its relative economic and military power was inevitably declining as Asia grew in dynamism and strength. China in particular was transforming the global economy. Having joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, China was a player, one of many, working within the international system. Cyber was an issue, but compared with today, its complexity, pervasiveness and pace of change were of a lesser order. Social media was changing the way people communicated and exchanged ideas, but its influence on national and international debates was still embryonic, and social media's use as a tool of mass disinformation was still largely theoretical. A decade on, much has changed. Many of 2010's foreign policy and security challenges are still with us, not least terrorism. But in 2010, the trend of disruption inherent in globalisation and technological development was not yet apparent. It was still to reshape the foreign and trade policies of many of Australia's most important partners, such as the United States and the European Union. We're now facing a much more complex strategic landscape where these challenges are multi-layered, evolving at a faster pace, and their impacts are felt more quickly and directly. These are also tests of governance. Recent years have taught us that all democracies must closely examine and vigilantly guard the resilience and robustness of their institutions. What has been clear most sharply throughout the COVID-19 pandemic is the increasingly inextricable nature of domestic and international policy and governance structures. Global crises like the pandemic and climate change are right in front of us without yet the levels of global cooperation to match. Malicious cyber activity, disinformation and foreign interference are increasingly confronting governments around the globe especially in countries like Australia, whose open economies and democratic system can be exploited by external actors. National economies, too, are being tested more now than they were in 2010. The COVID-19 pandemic has seen levels of joblessness and government debt rise dramatically around the world in 2020. We need to plot the path to recovery, even as foundational ideas about economic openness are being questioned, including to ensure adequate resilience to shocks. Geopolitical tensions have intensified, making multilateral cooperation harder, but showing us forcefully the need for joint action to resolve complex global challenges from climate change to persistent humanitarian crises. And at the same time, COVID-19 has demonstrated, in Prime Minister Morrison's words, that I, and I quote, international institutions are most effective when they are driven by and responsive to, accountable to, the society of sovereign states that forms them. But while global engagement and cooperation is essential to see us through the challenges we collectively face, the geostrategic landscape in the Indo-Pacific region is changing. Over the past decade, China's influence has risen as its economic weight has continued to grow, 
challenging American power, influence and interests as the US national security strategy articulated. This economic success has underpinned strong growth in China's military spending, delivering a significant boost in the range and sophistication of China's capabilities for projecting force in its region and beyond. China has become the largest trading partner of nearly all countries in our region and a leading source of foreign investment, infrastructure construction pro projects and loans for many. Its development has been impressive and has brought economic benefits beyond its borders to Australia and others. But it has also brought disruption, something China's leaders themselves recognise. Unsurprisingly, this has also meant that China wants to set rather than merely adopt international standards. China wants to lead rather than simply join international institutions. Crafting foreign and strategic policy in an environment such as this starts with clarity about our policy anchors and strategic strengths and then applying and adapting them to the challenges we face. The government anticipated much of this complex arena of increasing contest in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper. Aware of the rapid changes to Australia's external environment, the government needed to develop a framework under which we could, in a coherent, consistent way, advance Australia's national interests, built on our foundational values, such as our support for political, economic and religious freedoms. The White Paper identified five goals for our foreign policy. It almost seems redundant today and you to uh, mention them, but I will, in case, just in case anyone's a little rusty. They were and are promoting an open, inclusive Indo-Pacific in which the rights of all states are respected, delivering more opportunities for our businesses globally and standing against protectionism, ensuring Australians remain safe, secure and free in the face of threats, promoting and protecting the international rules and institutions that allow us to tackle global challenges, and stepping up our support for a more resilient Pacific and Timor-Leste. Seen from 2020, those goals remain the right ones, even if our operating environment has lurched in profound and negative ways. Drawing on Australia's tradition of constructive diplomacy, we're responding to strategic uncertainty and the accelerating trends I've described above. We are building new coalitions across the Indo-Pacific, developing and operationalising agendas with a neighbourhood that understands the importance of stability, of sovereignty and of rules. We're showing leadership in partnership with the South West Pacific, co-designing new pathways of economic integration and sustainable development, building trust and common approaches to security and prosperity. And we are engaging actively and constructively in global forums to shape outcomes that matter to our countries and our region's future. But we're still working hard to promote an open and inclusive region. The government has added substance and momentum to our partnerships with Japan, India and Indonesia, among others. Australia is rolling out an ambitious agenda to remain a leading partner of Southeast Asia by increasing our health, economic, capacity building and security assistance to the region post-COVID. Our Partnerships for Recovery COVID-19 Development Response Program will include substantial investment in vaccine access and economic recovery on top of our existing $1 billion a year development assistance to the region. Australia's support for a fast, safe vaccine rollout in the Pacific and Southeast Asia will mean we are able to return to more normal travel, tourism and trade with our key partners in the region, boosting shared economic recovery in a post-pandemic world. In the wake of COVID, our long-term goal of supporting our businesses globally has morphed into the urgent task of supporting national and international economic recovery. The biggest news on that front was the signing of the world's largest ever trade deal, 
the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, only last week. Through COVID, we've also worked hard to support Australians, whether here, at home or overseas. DFAT has helped over 30,000 Australians return home since March, and we're continuing to support tens of thousands of Australians still overseas. I'm proud that we've been able to deliver the biggest consular operation in our history, even as DFAT and our overseas missions, in some cases under quite draconian lockdowns, played a key role in sourcing PPE and testing kits at the height of the early phase of the pandemic. At the same time, we've worked to support the international system. The government carried out our first ever audit of multilateral institutions, which found that the multilateral system delivers outcomes vital to Australia's interests, but is under unprecedented strain. Consequently, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Maurice Payne, set out in detail in this lecture theatre in June, the government has committed to increasing our multilateral engagement. Mr Morrison has spoken about this lately, highlighting the good and cooperative work being done this year in the East Asia Summit, APEC and the G20, work which has occurred, I should say, even while the pandemic has been going on. And Pacific leaders will meet at the Pacific Islands Forum in the new year to explore regional solutions to regional issues. Australia's near neighbourhood faces unique challenges that were clear to us in 2017, but have only become more urgent, such as climate change, the health of oceans, and disaster resilience. Many Pacific economies have been hard hit by the economic effects of COVID. Fiji's economy, for example, has shrunk by more than a fifth as international tourism has shut down. In addition to our $1.44 billion development assistance for the Pacific in 2020-21, Australia has announced a temporary COVID response package of $304.7 million to support our nearest neighbours over two years. Now to the future. In an era of greater strategic competition in which Australia's partnerships are increasingly being tested, Advancing all of these goals will be perennially difficult. As we look ahead at the next 10 years, the key question for Australia will be, how successful are we at pursuing our national interests in this tougher, riskier environment defined by strategic competition? China's economic recovery will be an important factor in how the region and the world emerges from what threatens to be a long and uneven recovery from, COVID from the COVID-19 recession. But the questions around China are much more wide ranging than simply its economic approach. No power this large and globally integrated can escape scrutiny or debate. The rest of the world has done a lot of thinking about China's power and what it means, but it is less apparent that China has carefully considered other countries' reactions to its conduct internationally. China may have reached a point where it believes that it can largely set the terms of its future engagement with the world. If it has, I believe it is mistaken. And that is because there is far more to be gained for China and for everyone else through working constructively and collaboratively within the international system without resort to pressure or coercion. The future of our region depends in part on China's decisions, but it also depends on the decisions made by other countries in the Indo-Pacific, including the United States and other regional partners. The main challenge for Australia's foreign policy is one of shaping with other countries, a regional and global order that responds to the new realities of power. Inevitably, we are involved in a competition for influence because how the regional order evolves will profoundly shape our security and other interests. If Australia did not have an agenda and exercise agency, then we would have simply to accept the terms dictated by others. The 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper sets out this fundamental challenge clearly. Our interests lie in stability and in the character of the enduring peace we seek. 
Defining the character of our enduring peace isn't just about China. We have to be influential with the United States too. Much has changed in the relationship between the United States and the world it did so much to shape and establish in the wake of World War II. In the harsher light of the early to mid 21st century, we have to acknowledge that the United States cannot be expected to lead in the way it once did. As the triumphant leader of the Allies in 1945, the United States rebuilt Europe and then went on to rebuild much of the world in its own image. As a culture, it remains incredibly attractive and powerful. But its internal challenges, as President-elect Biden has made clear, will be a priority for the incoming administration and will shape the character of its international engagement. The moment of a single global superpower has gone, and now we have a sharper competition for power with many more visible and invisible sources of global influence than in previous decades. As the Prime Minister has said, we look to America, but we won't leave it to America. More and more, the United States has to share power, even as we understand that American power and purpose at home and abroad remain essential to the regional order we seek, the sort of multilateral system we need, and to reviving the global economy. Australia also needs to work hard to build the practice of cooperation among all nations. How we cooperate, the extent to which the global community comes together on particular issues, is not a simple question of the degree of superpower competition or cooperation. In a tougher strategic environment, different nations and groups of nations are already coming together in different ways, sometimes through existing institutions, sometimes minilaterally or plurilaterally. That underpins the rationale for Australia's engagement with the United States, Japan and India through the quadrilateral dialogue, where each of the four partners sees the world in remarkably similar way and utilises their agency to shape the sort of region we desire. Against all odds in the face of a global pandemic sucking in all attention, Multilateral and regional summits this year, like the East Asia Summit, APEC and the G20, have delivered unexpected cooperation. Modest, certainly, but cooperation nonetheless. While a reasonable bookmaker might have concluded none of these forums was worth a wager in 2020, each has taken place and each has provided valuable opportunities for global engagement and cooperation and for giving voice to some important principles. The East Asia Summit, for example, underlined the continued importance of ASEAN and its outlook on the Indo-Pacific, with a common appreciation that issues like the South China Sea and the rights of small states still matter, even as we grapple with a health and economic crisis. All of these summits have delivered clarion calls for equitable access to vaccines to underpin global economic recovery. Colleagues, much has changed in the security landscape that surrounds Australia in the past decade. If we want to look back on our time in another 10 years, in 2030, what will we need to have done as a country in order to be confident that we did all we could to advance Australia's national interest, even as our environment changes? First and foremost, we will have had to have pursued our own interests and acted with agency and purpose. Ideally, we will have done so in a way that helped our partners, influenced our allies, and supported an Indo-Pacific order that sustained peace and the ability of all countries to shape their own destiny. We cannot hope to achieve this outcome alone. As one of my predecessors said, Australia cannot buy or bully its way in the world. We need influence and we need to build, sustain and use our policy instruments to our advantage. Secondly, we will have needed to maintain strong domestic foundations with a flexible and competitive economy driving recovery from COVID. This is why the government's domestic response to COVID is so important. 
Our international engagement supports our efforts to build our economy and our society, and nothing can be achieved externally without them. The White Paper's first chapter on the importance of domestic foundations continues to ring true. If our economic foundations are not strong, if we cannot safeguard our sovereignty and provide opportunity to our people, then we will not be able to exercise influence overseas. And thirdly, to be successful, we will also need to have credibly fused our interests and values. The things we stand for at home, such as openness, fairness, and a level playing field, will shape our international engagement. It is the character of the international order, not just the way power is distributed, that matters. This is not about imposing our view on others. We know and understand that an era within which we felt comfortable has passed. But it is about building a system with the flexibility, resilience and openness that supports economic growth and sustained peace for all countries in the Indo-Pacific and globally. These are big challenges for Australia over the next 10 years, which I'm confident we'll be able to tackle together with our global partners and trusted partners at home, including, of course, the National Security College. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Secretary. Thank you, Francis. That was uh, not only a really illuminating speech, and it took a, uh, a really big time horizon that I think uh, is really useful for us, and I'm sure students in the room are, are, are taking notes. Uh, you, 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 you chanced your hand at the future as well as the past and the present, and I think you spoke in, uh, I, I think, in some very useful and broad terms about how we may see the present phase of Australian foreign and external policy more broadly with the benefit of 10 years hindsight. I want to get a little more specific on that, if I may, um, and I want to sort of cover a few areas in this conversation, but I really would like to, um, to zoom in a little on the Australia-China relationship, which is in the headlines uh, uh, frequently, and of course uh, there's no you know, there's, there's no question, there's no secret that this has been and is uh, a very difficult year in that relationship. Uh, looking from your vantage point that you've projected 10 years in the future, looking back at 2020, look at, looking at the policy settings, the decisions, the way in which Australia is handling the, however you define it, the, the pressure, the leverage that China uh, has been exerting on us, um, how would you see the decisions made this year in the benefit of that that ten year hindsight? What will be what will you see as the the big picture, the objectives uh, of this year? Okay, well, thanks, Rory. Look, I, I think well, in twenty thirty, inevitably, when we look back at twenty twenty, uh, it'll all be about COVID, uh, and and that won't just be about COVID happening. By you know, a decade hence, we'll have a much better idea really of, of what the what the uh, the impact was economically and of course economically leads to strategically uh, I think w we shouldn't underestimate the impact that that COVID has had on all countries globally and of course that includes China it's sometimes difficult uh, to know really um, in in societies which are totally open, one normally has a, a pretty good idea in, in societies that are less open. It can sometimes be difficult to tell and, and it takes time to tell. You, and I think, you know, we, we see, because it's been such a shock, we see some uh, contradictions uh, even in China itself. I mean, the, the idea uh, that China needs to become more self-sufficient. Now, self-sufficiency isn't, that's not unique to China, actually. I think just about all countries have wondered about the degree to which they need to be self-sufficient. But on the one hand, wanting to be self-sufficient, but it, but also more influential globally. I mean, that's a contradiction. How, how is that going to be, how is that going to be worked out? Look, when it comes to the detail of what we're dealing with now, uh, I'm not so sure that that will 
loom large in 2030, but I think the principles and the reason I, I sort of looked ahead and said if we're going to be in 2030 and we look back, what will we have wanted to have done? And of course, making our own decisions is a significant part of that and I think there's, frankly, abundant evidence that that is what Australia does. Uh, in my 35 years as a diplomat, that's all I've ever seen, us making decisions in our own interest. But we've also made it clear that we uh, you know, we want a region, we want to find a settling point. I think everyone's talking about where might a settling point be, when might we find it. A settling point which, you know, is a region that is peaceful, secure, stable. Of course, where China is a, a major regional power and, and over time increasingly a, obviously a global power as well. We want to be able to manage our differences. Uh, we, Australia, don't see that as being... Uh, too much of a stretch, actually. We think it can be done. It's a matter of, of talking to each other. It's a matter of dialogue. It's a matter of openness of communication. Now, look, there's a, there is a, a fair degree of communication in both directions at the moment, but not in all the ways that we would like that to happen. So I think you know, I've also talk, I've talked about the shaping of the region, the character of the region. I think one of the things that COVID has actually done is it's, it's brought us all up short. Yeah. What, what really matters? Rather than just ploughing on, what really matters? And I think you know, whether you look at the ASEAN Australia Summit, the sort of language that was used in the summits, now it's a platform for communication. What's on, what's on people's minds? What are they doing? But if you look at the strengthening of Australia's partnerships across the region, you know, with, with individual ASEANs, with six of them, I think we now either have a, a strategic partnership or a comprehensive strategic partnership. Uh, in discussions in minilaterals have uh, established that you know, everyone has their red lines. Everyone has national interests that they want to be able to defend. And one of the points the Prime Minister's consistently made is what we want and what we think others want also is a region of sovereign independent states uh, resistant to coercion and open to cooperation. Um, and it would be my hope over time that we will head in that direction. But I don't think it's guaranteed at all. Uh, and I think uh, we've all got work to do uh, even as we look towards a new US administration. Uh, we, we, we may come back to that if we have time. Thank you. I think you you did touch also on that theme, you know, that, that very key message about independent uh, policy decisions, independent foreign uh, and strategic policy decisions in this country. There is a view uh, that we hear from time to time, and I'm sure you hear it, and, and, and perhaps one can define it partly as propaganda, but it's out there that, of course, Australia doesn't make its own decisions. That we're very much uh, reduced to a part of a US-China dynamic, uh, and we're essentially a, a subset of the United States in that dynamic. Uh, I'm sure you and colleagues in Australian embassies uh, had that view put to them from time to time. How do, um, interesting, how do you respond? How, how, do, how do you and your colleagues respond? Well, look, I mean, I, I hear that view. I don't see it, and to be honest, as a practising diplomat, where I've been, you know, over over the last three decades, mm. I, I've not really encountered it either. I think I think it's a it's a it's a construct that some people use, but it's not something that tends to get in the way of you know, what we do, because diplomats themselves are all about, as my many colleagues in the room know, uh, you know, it's about uh, seeking to uh, to develop relationships, uh, to build things, actually, to build cooperation together. Yes, to exercise influence, but to do so openly and transparently. And that requires a, a degree of skill. I mean, you know, not every diplomat uh, around the world can say that they're an expert in Australia and how we do things. But members of the diplomatic corps here can, and that enables them to know how we think, how we think about our interests, and to, more effectively than otherwise, uh, develop our mutual interests. And of course, that's what Australian diplomats do themselves. Look, in relation to the US, it's not surprising that countries with similar values will come to similar conclusions. Right. That, that, that stands to reason. But the order in which we do it, the pace in which we do it, the actual decisions themselves are based on national interest and are based on you know, thorough discussion and consideration of all elements of decisions through the through the sort of proper processes. So, 
you know, it's not surprising. The world's moving at a great pace. Decisions need to be made. Um, I do recall, it must have been about three years ago, I actually came to ANU to, to launch a book uh, published by someone who now works for DFAT, Shannon Tao, on an independent foreign policy. She'd done a lot of research into it. She'd drawn the same conclusion that I'd drawn as a practitioner. Mm. We act in our interests. Of course, we're an alliance partner of the United States. That means we have some shared interests. But when we act, it's in Australia's interests. That's um, a, a useful um, shout out for uh, some of the expertise that ANU generates as well uh, and that connection with policy. Uh, so you've talked about diplomats and what diplomats do and of course there's often a bit of mystique uh, about that. Uh, much less so these days I think when we've seen the, uh, the extraordinary consular effort, the effort to help Australians in difficult situations around the world and the way in which a lot of your staff I know have been very stretched and challenged by that experience because they themselves have been dealing with uh, really COVID world. Uh, I don't necessarily want to put the question to you about that. You're welcome to, 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 to address that, but it has been addressed in the past. But there are other sides to a diplomat's job. And I wonder in this, in this environment where Australia's trying to achieve the, the long-term strategic effects, the shaping effect that you talk about in your remarks, that involves needing to obviously understand our region, understand uh, the dynamics in the world, anticipate and understand how other countries are perceiving and responding to our policy positions. Can you shed some light on that side of the work that happens in your department? Sure, and that's, well, I think you've given a very good description of it. Actually, that's exactly what we do. I mean, we're not wherever we are to mark time. As the, as the Prime Minister said, you know, we're not bystanders. Australia's not bystanders and our diplomats are not bystanders either. You're not there to, to sort of record what's going on. Uh, you're there to understand deeply another country, another society, often by speaking another language, the, the quality of, of the contacts, the, the, the doors that either open to you if you're effective or remain closed if you're not, those doors then lead, uh, in my view and in our view and the view of many of my colleagues, it's certainly the government's expectation, they lead to outcomes. The reason you want to get through the door in the first place is to achieve an outcome. And that's, by definition, an outcome that brings benefit to the country you're working in unless you're in a, in a multilateral post. But of course, uh, we have an ASEAN mission in Jakarta uh, and that job, of course, the job of that, our ambassador there, is to deepen and develop our relationships with ASEAN. ASEAN is absolutely central to the future of the region in a strategic sense and, and a strong, focused ASEAN. That's why I mentioned in, in my speech the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which was mentioned frequently, actually, at the East Asia Summit. Not by absolutely every Everybody, but by most countries in the region. Just as most countries in the region, because they understand the importance of uh, disputes being settled in accordance with international law. So we work to obviously to encourage these things. Mm. You can't simply say international law is important. You've got to be willing to mm. uphold it. You've got to be willing to call out breaches. You've got to be willing to help to uh, develop solutions, to actually engage in processes yourselves, mm. to, to, ex to subject yourself to processes as we did in the, the um, boundary conciliation process with, with Timor-Leste. Uh, but it's also about being ambitious for the relationship. And, you know, it, it, really it's leaders who drive that ambition. It's prime ministers and presidents who recognise that the interests of their country are going to be best served by deepening a relationship with Australia's case, India, with Indonesia, with Japan. Why do, why do they do that? Why does the Prime Minister travel to Tokyo in the middle of a pandemic? Why does he do a virtual summit with India in the middle of a pandemic? Uh, why, do, why, why do diplomats do what they do to prepare? It's because our national interests are best advanced through that way, and in particular, uh, at a time of great challenge in the region, there is a sense of solidarity, a sense of uh, shared I suppose, burden sharing, a sense of uh, helping to create rules and norms that will serve us well in the future. And if you're just going to be a bystander, then it'll all just happen around you. Australia's not a bystander. We're an active participant. We want to shape a region in the interests of all countries in the Indo-Pacific, but particularly, of course, Australia. 
So you've mentioned COVID. How much harder has the COVID-19 environment made that kind of work, that kind of day-to-day -day diplomacy at understanding and responding and shaping to, uh, to our region? Well, on, on the one hand, and in a very functional way, of yes. course, it's made it harder. Communicating yeah. is harder. But on the other hand, we have kept all 112 of our overseas missions operational during this period. So we've had people on the ground. They may have been in quarantine. They may have been ill themselves. But they have been communicating, and if you're an ambassador, that means you're communicating at very senior levels normally uh, with the government that you're... Uh, accredited to or the country that you're accredited to. So because we've been there, because we've been good partners and, you know, it's got to be a sort of certain level of modesty about this, but we get very, we've had very positive feedback during this period from our partners in the South Pacific, many of whom have completely closed off mm -hmm. their countries, many of whom have relied on us. To, uh, to help them with PPE, to help them with uh, building the capability that they need. They've all got health systems, but they've needed our capability when it comes to epidemiology, when it comes to, to dealing with, with COVID. And so we've actually, and we've established humanitarian corridors. We've done a whole range of really practical things. You know, whether you call it a COVID pivot, whether you call it mm. partnerships for recovery, we've been there, we've been fast, we've been responsive, we've been working working hand in hand. And we've been doing that across Southeast Asia as well. And that's, it was very heartening that ASEAN has agreed that from next year we'll have an annual ASEAN Australia Summit. Mm. It's why the government, even in a, a, a fiscal environment such as the one that we're in, has agreed to, you know, half a billion dollars worth of uh, of funding for vaccines across the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, to very substantial funding as a loan for economic recovery in the Pacific, for funding that will uh, help support development in the Mekong region, uh, that will uh, go towards infrastructure, that will enable us to deepen our defence cooperation. They're all very practical things and hugely appreciated. I mean, a $1.5 billion loan for Indonesia, you know, working across the region about what they need and how we can respond. And I think so, although it's difficult at the beginning in practical terms, in reality, I think we've made enormous progress on a whole range of things that, that matter. A lot of it's been quiet and unsung. We've done an enormous amount of policy development for government and on the ground, the doors are opening, the outcomes are being produced, the strategic effect is being further developed. Thank you. I know that several, uh, or probably many in the room, will have their own questions, which I'll turn to in a moment. But I want to ask you one last question before I go to the uh, the wider audience, and that is to pivot a little bit to uh, to talking about you rather than uh, Australia's national interest, if I may, uh, because one of the one of the things we like to do in these conversations is to look, uh, I guess, at, at, at one's career and at uh, the the way in which you've achieved a kind of a staying power in your career, your advice to the next generation, uh, whether it's about work-life balance, which I know in a role like yours is, uh, is, is pretty special, I guess, uh, whether it's about that longer perspective. So are there any, is there anything you can share, uh, I guess, as advice to uh, people pursuing careers in this space? Look, uh, it, it is a bit of a pivot to think about that, but uh, there are a couple of things I'd say that, that might serve as, as useful pieces of advice. Uh, I can think of three occasions this year. I mean, they were, they were brief moments rather than, you know, an, hours versus days where I felt I've hit the buffers. I felt I've got no more to give and yet the demands are, are so great. And what do you do then? Well, you've got to have a voice inside your head. You've got to be a bit sort of objective. I'm speaking to the students here about how you're actually performing, how, you, how you're feeling, what are the signs to you that the stress is just getting too much. Uh, and at that point, you, you just have to step back a little bit and you have to Make sure you're getting the sleep you need and getting the exercise that you need and having the walks on Red Hill or doing the virtual Pilates sessions or whatever it might mean. I, and I, I, I don't miss those. They're on, I'm not sure that my ministers know it, but they're on Monday nights and <laughs> I, I'm always there virtually and if I just happen not to answer the phone for an hour, well, that's, secret, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so you, you've got to recognise your, uh, your own mental health, your own physical uh, limitations and you've got to be very quick to, to then just step back 
build that resilience and keep going. And, and look, I can do it quickly. Uh, it may, I may not have started out that way, but I can now do it pretty quickly. When it comes to work-life balance, I think, you know, I struggled with that concept even 20 years ago, I have to say. Just what did it mean? I think most people do. What, where, where, you know, is it like that or like that? Or what, what is the balance? And of course, we can all strike our own. But I think these days the conversation is much more around, partly because it's been technologically enabled, if I can put it that way, how do you sort of integrate things so that you can perform your professional role, whatever that might be, and actually your, your, your personal life, whether there are obligations in your personal life, and most of us have obligations of some kind, which we sort of willingly acquit uh, to friends and to family and to others, but, but you need to be able to get all of that done, and, and I've had to get a lot more efficient mm -hmm. at getting all of that done, uh, you know, including making my own lunches for the next week and, you know, that sort of, that sort of stuff. But, look, you, you know, you, you, you do it. You just... The, the only thing I can now do... For a while, we all thought it's possible to multitask, right? Well, it may be possible to multitask when you're below a certain age. I'm not sure what that is, but I know I've passed it. The only thing I multitask with is watching Insiders on the weekend while I'm doing a whole lot of chores. I watch it on iView afterwards, and then I can... That's the only time in the week I do two things at once, but otherwise, whatever I'm doing uh, get, gets my full concentration, including time with family. That's, that, that, that's really useful and, I think, reassuring as well. Um, let's take a few questions from the floor, and I'm going to um, uh, ruthlessly privilege students. Uh, so if any ANU student has a question, they'll probably get, uh, get, get in first. Um, and uh, I might begin with, um, uh, I think it's, uh, is it Will? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Rory, and thanks, Secretary. Um, my question is a simple one, but I don't think it has a necessarily simple answer. So, thinking about how Australia engages with the world, what's one thing that we're not doing that you wish we would, and what's one thing that we are doing that you wish we'd stop? Josh, you're, you're right that the simple questions are the, are the hardest. You can tell that I'm not getting these questions in advance. I can I? load up more questions. <laughs> I, I can load up more questions as you well, think through that yeah, one if you'd like. Well, look, I mean, of course, uh, your question uh, sort of implies, in a way, that that we that we're not very agile or, or nimble. That we're not sort of. Um, Ducking and weaving, or or being, or making adjustments as as we need to go, you, you know. And I think that, that maybe there was a time when uh, we probably were inclined to say a bit too much. I think I'd like to think we've got over that. Being a good partner often means listening, uh, listening really intently, uh, and doing what you do in genuine partnership. And I think you know it's no accident really that the word partnership is used so often these days because it's in its most genuine sense it's it's highly valued. And so I think uh, I would if, if there was one, if you asked me one thing to wish for, I would wish that. All of our diplomats, uh, and it's not just about diplomats, obviously, but when we're in situations where we're seeking to advance Australia's interests, that the very first thing on our minds is to listen, and often an instinct is to speak. So I think that would be one thing. Uh, the other thing, and I can say this because we've only the, the funding's only just been decided, so therefore it's new. So I'm going to refine. Your, uh, my, your, your question or redefine your question. I want us to be able to make absolutely maximum use of the additional funding that the government's given us over and above the $4 billion development assistance envelope, which of course remains, but we've got in this special environment, we've got real opportunities when it comes to, particularly to vaccines and to economic recovery, to uh, to really make a difference there. And, and, you know, the Prime Minister's put a lot of emphasis on implementation. He's established a new cabinet committee to, to really focus hard on implementation. And I'd like us to be the, the, the sort of pin-up poster people when, we're, when our implementation's looked at in two years' time. Thank you. We'll take uh, over this side a question. Uh, Ingrid, if you can... Uh, in Ingrid, here, please. So oh, sorry. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Secretary Francis Adamson, and thank you, Professor Rory Medcalf. Can you speak up a little? Sure, definitely. Um, Rory, in your book, you wrote that words create worlds, and Secretary Francis Adamson, you wrote that the objective for 2030 is for Australia to see a different character or a character that reflects the Australian spirit of the international order. Um, in your words, how would you describe the Australian national spirit, um, the way we want to perceive ourselves and the way that we want to be perceived by others in the region? Thank you. Thanks. Well, look, the, the Australian national spirit is, I mean, a lot of books have been written uh, about, about that. Uh, in terms of, though, the way we see... I mean, look, it, 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 in a way, it's a little bit similar to what I was talking about and, and what I've just answered, which is... You know, I think Australians genuinely want... I mean, this is a stereotypical thing. I mean, it, all of the diplomats in the room would expect me to say this. You know, we, we, we like to think that we give everybody a fair go and, and we like to be given a fair go ourselves. And I think if there's one thing about us and about our region that, that absolutely translates across and it's got not so much to do with the integration of foreign policy and domestic policy or strategic policy and domestic policy but if there was to be you know a single motto it's probably a, a fair go for everyone because that that fits into the broader framework that I set and it's what we like to think about you know how things work within Australia um, it's certainly what we aspire to I know we sometimes fall short uh, and we probably do internationally as well too but that's I think what I would say now you, you brought Rory into this so he should not have my, an opportunity as well <laughs> it's not my presentation I'll we'll take I'll we'll take your question and then I think we can take one more student maybe uh, Tim as well and then I think we might be at time so why don't we take the two together please Hi, uh, Oscar Dowling from the Noetic Group. I just wanted to uh, pivot back to your career, um, uh, specifically uh, what's next for Secretary Adamson. I hear of vice regal rumours coming out of South Australia. I know you can't confirm those, but more broadly, could you uh, elaborate on the uh, legacy that you hope to leave in your department and in foreign policy more broadly? And before you answer that, we'll take the other question, which gives you the perfect opportunity not to answer the entire question. Well, thank you very much, Secretary Adamson. Um, Tim Hobbs from uh, the Australian Crisis Simulation Summit. And earlier we, early we ran this uh, crisis simulation with many of the people in this room. We're very thankful for all the support from Rory and the, the National Security College as well. And one of the things we tried to simulate was um, the impact of an inequitable distribution of the vaccine, of the COVID vaccine. Um, so I was just wondering, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on what impact would an inequitable distribution of the COVID vaccine have on your ambition for Australia's future? Okay, well, let me, I, I will answer that in a, your question in a way, but in, when it comes to vaccines, I mean, this is the big issue of, of the moment. It really was, I mean, I, I've done the, the, the five summits over many late nights, well, five late nights, let's just be truthful about it, over the last couple of weeks. And, and vaccines is the, the big, it's what every leader wants to talk about, and everyone's talking about equitable distribution. That's what, that's what everyone wants. What does that mean in practice? Look, there's a, there's a lot of work, a lot of thought going into it. I mean, even as the vaccine makers are rushing to, to sort of get their results out and, and to, to ramp up production, and, uh, and even as there are big debates, or not just debates, I mean, there are big challenges around distribution and all the rest of it. Um, but how it's done and how, it ro how it's rolled out, I, th I think that's going to speak very loudly and clearly about what our priorities are as an international community. A and it's going to have to be done on a community-wide basis. I mean, the, the, uh, the COVAX AMC, of course, that's the, you know, the 20 per cent. Well, which 20 per cent uh, in, in developing countries? I mean, the most vulnerable, that makes a lot of sense to us, but it doesn't, that's not the way necessarily all societies are going to be able to do it. So I think it's, I think it's going to take time. There are going to be enormous logistical challenges. I think as leaders come together in the next cycle and as ministers do, including health ministers, it's going to be much more about the, about the how, not the overarching principle, but the how. And in that, as you can see, Australia's got tremendous expertise, health expertise, domestically. We're applying that not just domestically, but regionally and, and, and globally. There are Australians involved in the WHO. There's Jane Holton at CEPI and a range of other Others. So it's probably a bit early for is the right question. I can't give you the answer yet, but it but boy is it the big sort of hot button issue at the moment. 
Oh, I think it's way too early to start talking about legacies. Uh, so l l let me just say, I mean, DFAT's whole role, and, and the Prime Minister spoke to the public service this morning, it's really, obviously, it's about serving Australians, serving Australians at home. We've done that in a wide var variety of ways, including PPE procurement and all the rest of it during this period. Serving Australians overseas, very obviously. You know, we've got to stand firm at times, we've got to be principled. I actually think, uh, and I've made a, a thing of it over the last four and a bit years, uh, we need to be representative of, of the diversity of Australia. Uh, and that means some things have had to change over time. I think we are more diverse. We want the very best talent wherever that comes from across Australia. But it's got to be you know, diversity of thinking, cognitive diversity, as well as diversity of backgrounds and interests and uh, all of those sorts of things. Because that's one of the... The big, um, well, I, uh, with respect to all of my diplomatic colleagues, I can't think of any other country I'd rather represent overseas. Perhaps it's the same for them. We won't ask them, but for me, it's all got to be, it's got to be about serving Australia and we've got to do that to the best of our ability. We've got to do it authentically. We've got to be able to deliver on our promises, implement uh, what we do, and we've got to have an eye to strategy, the broader strategy, the broader challenge of shaping a region. We don't actually really know what it'll look like in 2030, but by the time 2030 comes around, I want to be able to look back and say, we did our best and I had a, a part to play in that. Look, we, um, we are at time, unfortunately. I know there are a few other questions in the room, including from respected academic colleagues uh, and perhaps our friends in the, the media as well, but we are uh, at time. Um, I want to uh, personally thank you, Francis, for being uh, not only for the recruitment advertisement for um, uh, the next generation of young Australian, or maybe not so young Australian diplomats, uh, but also, I think, for really being so frank uh, about uh, about the, the challenges and the opportunities for Australia and the work that you and the department do. So with that, uh, I might ask the, um, the audience to join me in, uh, in thanking Secretary Francis Adamson. Thank you. Take your hand, but you know. <laughs>